So how many of you in the past one week have felt stressed? I think I should see about 100%. Huh? I leave my hand up because I'm also like that. <laughs> I have definitely felt it, right? Okay, second question. How many of you wish that in that moment of stress that you had a magic wand that could make it all go away? Yes. Bing, I throw to you. La. <laughs> now, I'm not here to offer you a magic wand, but I'm here as the happiness scientist because I want to share with you stuff that you can use, strategies rooted in science that can help you during your most stressful moments. Now, you may think that just because I'm the happiness scientist and just because I'm here sharing these tools with you, that I never experienced stress. What do you all think? Yes or no? Those of you think, oh yeah, she's invulnerable to it. Raise your hands. All right. So many of us have the misconception that if we know it, then stress will never come for us. I like to think of it the other way. That if we know it, we can be better prepared to face it when it comes because it will. So I want to tell you a story about Peter. Now, Peter is a teacher. And one day, Peter is sitting in the staff room having a cup of coffee when he hears some news come in from the ministry. Or in fact, his colleagues are standing in a corner as they are making their coffee and they are having some discussion. Hey, did you hear about this? Hey, did you know that with the new MOE metrics, we all have to key all these things into the system? Now, poor Peter is sitting here enjoying his cup of coffee. Now, there's something you must know about Peter before I tell you a little bit more about his story. He is a very hardworking teacher. He's very caring. In fact, he has been known to be one of those teachers who stays behind to support his students whenever they are stressed because he cares about them. He's a family man. He has three children and a good relationship with his wife. However, Peter has a little bit of a challenge when it comes to stress. So he's sitting there trying to enjoy his coffee and he's hearing this new metric that MOE ministry is trying to ask him to do. And instantly he gets up from his chair and he says, what? Another new metric, another new initiative as if I got nothing better to do? I've got so much on my plate. And yesterday my wife just told me, hey, Spend some time at home with the kids. Why are you always at work? Am I ever going to have any time to sleep? And as he sits there, the coffee is going cold and his mind is in a swirl. And finally, he sits back down. And he thinks, maybe it's just me. Everyone seems to be still chill at the pantry. Maybe it's just me. I can't take all these changes. They're coming too fast. Maybe it's just I can't manage it. Now, have you ever felt like Peter did? In fact, I think there's a lot of Peter in all of us, or a little bit of Peter in some of us. Now, let's take a look at what's happening in Peter's brain. You see, when your brain is in peacetime, it looks a bit like this picture on the left. Now, if you look at the parts where the arrow is pointing, it's actually pointing to this part of our brain called the amygdala. Don't need to remember, just know that it's a very important part of your brain responsible for your emotional control. And when you're calm, peacetime brain, it looks just as the scan shows. However, when you are not calm and we call it the anxious brain, then you can see that the parts here from blue have become green. And when that happens, your amygdala is activated, throwing you from calm into stress, what Peter is experiencing, what psychologists call the amygdala hijack. Literally, your brain has been hijacked. And have you ever felt that feeling before? You are trying to study for an exam and you're prepared so hard. And then when you sit down there, hmm, why is my mind blank? Yes, I see nods here means you relate to that. 
many of us as well. And this is what we call the freeze response. Now, the amygdala is such an important part of our brain. And honestly, it's constantly asking it's, itself, am I safe? Can I do this? Is there a threat around me? If there's a threat, what am I going to do? And its main purpose is to protect us. Make sure that we don't fall into danger. And therefore, whenever, in Peter's case, he hears something that is mildly aggravating or triggering, the amygdala sends out a red alert. Nino, 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 you're not safe. You're not safe, Peter. Do something about it. And Peter gets activated into either fight, into flight, or into freeze, going numb. I'll leave you to decide what state Peter was in just now. But the fight, flight, and freeze mode is when the amygdala takes over. And you have probably been in there before. You probably recognize a little bit of Peter in you because when the amygdala takes over, your survival mechanism kicks in. It's telling you, you're not safe, you need to protect yourself. Come on, do something. When the threat is too big, sometimes you freeze because you have no idea. We call this my mind going blank. Or maybe in your terms, I just felt numb. I didn't know what to do. Yes, I see some nods in the audience as well. And so what happens is that in the survival mechanism, it's activating all parts of you and what you feel inside your body is fear. You recognize it, maybe you start to feel some rumbling in your tummy. Maybe you start to feel your heart rate in your chest. <laughs> if, you, if I asked you to take over me right now, maybe that's what would happen. And what it does is the cortisol hormone starts to be produced when you're stressed. And all these experiences put together just tell you something's not right. This is scary. This is threatening. Our brain has been activated. So what happens then? When we get into this state, we start to feel a little helpless. So I'm going to go to the next slide. As you can see, it's not. Can you help me with the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. And that's when we might start to feel something's going wrong. Maybe we'll start to self-blame. So later, I'll share with you a concept called learn optimism. But for now, we are looking at this idea called learn helplessness, coined by Dr. Martin Seligman when he noticed in his experiments that after repeated failure, people tend to give up. They start to create a narrative in their mind that I can't do this. I'm not good enough. And in fact, they aren't born helpless. They just learn to become helpless. So think about it for yourself. In moments where you have felt, I'm not making any progress. In moments where you have felt, oh, man, this is just too difficult for me. Maybe you're in this state. You're starting to blame yourself. Maybe you see a little bit of Peter catastrophizing, going down that little rabbit hole and really hard to get out of it. Learn helplessness is also sometimes when you feel overwhelmed and your brain starts to shut down to self-preserve. Now, how many of you have felt helpless before? Yeah, just take a look around, right? And in this moment, maybe you felt like you were experiencing it all alone. But the truth is, we all have at some point in time felt a little helpless as well. And here's where three Ps are going to be really important. Number one, in that moment, you could feel a sense of permanence. This is going to last forever. Yes. Second one, you might think that it's pervasive. It's going to affect all of your life. Did you see it in Peter's example? He thought he wasn't going to get enough sleep. He thought his wife was going to nag him a little bit more. He thought, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? This is that sense of pervasiveness. And the last part, where he sat down in despair, maybe it's just me. Maybe I can't do this. This is what we call personalization. Now, if we encounter a challenging situation and we are stuck in the three Ps, pervasiveness, personalization, and permanence, it's quite likely we'll feel very pessimistic about the situation. That it's not going to change. It's not going to be in your favor. So maybe some of you secretly identify as a pessimist. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that I am a pessimist 
or an optimist? Okay, yeah. Ask question. How many of you think that I am a pessimist actually? Hands up. Yeah, see, yeah. Maybe only three hands. Huh? That means I have deceptive, I have fooled you well. <laughs> so, why am I bringing this up? Because some of you who may be sitting in the audience may think, hey, if I'm a pessimist and I see myself in these three Ps, does it mean it's the end of the line for me? Does it mean I can't do anything about it? But years and years and years ago, I was exactly like Peter. I was also a teacher. And I often had these thoughts running in my mind. It was only until I came across something amazing, which I'm about to share with you, which turned the trajectory of me being able to say, hey, it's possible to shift the way that I think. It's possible to train my brain. So let's go on to an example, okay? So let's have this example of, hey, I did not get a promotion. Maybe more relevant for the working adults. Don't worry, students. I have an example for you as well. <laughs> and what might the person say when they're stuck in a pessimistic outlook and it's permanent? They might say, oh, no matter how I try, I'll never get anything I want. Notice when words like never, always, very extreme use of words, that's why we think permanent thinking. Now, what about the optimist who looks at a challenging situation and actually thinks there is some possibility? Dr. Ho talk about possibility, right? And then they'll start thinking, hey, maybe I missed this promotion, but there might be some opportunities ahead of me. Now, between these two thoughts, who is more likely to take action? I hear some mumblings. Just shout it out. Is it the pessimist or the optimist? The optimist, right? Let's try another example. What would they say when they didn't get the promotion? Maybe a very pervasive thought. Nothing in my life ever works out. Again, notice the extreme words. Nothing ever. So if you're thinking like this, you may self-identify that you might be stuck in pervasive negative thoughts. But what does the optimist say? It says, well, I didn't get the promotion this time but my supervisor told me that my chances would be higher next year. Again, who's going to look more hopeful towards the future? The optimistic way of thinking. Last part, personalization. I didn't get that promotion. Maybe the person will say, oh, I'll never be worthy of promotion. Maybe some of you are thinking, I'll never get this subject right. I'll never be able to make it. So again, notice your language. If you're using extreme words, you might be stuck in the left-hand column. And instead, what we hope for you to shift to is perhaps this. Well, that promotion, I was up against some really worthy colleagues in my department. And that's the reason why I may not have been able to get it this time. So this is the working adult example. Let's do the next one. I got a bad grade in one of my modules. Common or something you worry about for the students? So maybe what we'll do is we'll just turn to the person next to you and would like you to talk to the person. What do you think could be an example for the first one? Permanent thinking pessimist, permanent thinking optimist. What might they say to themselves? Okay, let's have a one minute buzz with your partner. Okay, come, let's, I want to come down to the audience and ask them because I, I don't like just standing there. I feel very uncomfortable, you know, I like to be around people. So I'm going to ask, uh, what do you think the pessimistic permanent person might say? I'm going to ask these two gentlemen here. What might they say? Ah, oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, what might the pessimist permanent thought be? I always underperform. I always, because you're used always. And what about yourself? Well, pessimist. Yeah. I will never do well. I will never do well. Okay, so let's see what's there. Right, see, he read my slides ahead of time. Huh? <laughs> I'm never going to do well. Okay, pass it behind. Huh? Pass it behind. How about this one? Optimist, let's try. What would the optimist say? If I try harder, maybe I can achieve a better score in this module. Yeah, if I try harder, what do you notice there? I would try some efforts putting in and also maybe, right? So let's see what happens here. Yeah, it feels really bad, but I can learn from my mistakes and try again okay 
So it sounds like, hey, is Sean just giving us a magic pill? Can we just change our sentences and then therefore change the way that we do things? Is it that easy? And I said earlier, I'm not giving you a magic pill, but let's look and look at how the response could be for the pervasiveness. My life is over. Have you all said that to yourself before? I hear that from my 14-year-old sometimes. She says, my life is over, mom. And then we have a little laugh about it, right? But what does Optimus say? He might say, well, I did badly in this one module, but if I pull back and look at the bigger picture, maybe it's not all that bad. In the moment, it can feel really bad, but what we feel versus what is reality may often be very different. What we feel can be very intense, but what actually is, if you look at it objectively, may be very different. But in that moment, we can't see it because what has been hijacked? The amygdala. Our brain has been hijacked and therefore we got seized. Let's look at the third example. I'm just not that good in that topic. I just can't do it. Whether it's this or this, it's just, I can't do it. I'm limited. But the optimist might say, well, that module wasn't the easiest and not only I struggled with it. Notice that you are kinder to yourself as well when you tell yourself, hey, maybe it's not just me. It wasn't the easiest. So the switch between a pessimist and an optimist does not happen overnight, but there are some processes which I'm going to share with you that hopefully you can use to train your brain to nurture it with more positivity. So now we're going to do a little poll. So can you take out your phones and scan this QR code? And really, I just want to find out from you and all of you online as well, which of the three Ps do you often find yourself stuck in? Okay, which of the three Ps do you often find yourself stuck in? Is it personalization? Is it pervasiveness? Is it permanence? Okay, and very shortly, we'll be able to see the response on the screen. Now, as you're keying in, I think there are multiple options. You can listen to a little bit of a story. So many years ago, when I had just given birth to my second daughter, she's now nine, so many, many years ago, um, I was back on campus and I was at Yale and US College at the time. And I had just come back and had settled her into her school. I was a bit nervous because I didn't know how she will adapt. And I thought, maybe they're going to call me because something's not going right. But nothing happened in the morning. So I said, oh, maybe I can chill, I can go for a coffee. But just as I was about to pay for my coffee, the phone rang. And on the phone, it said, Zoe's school. Now, I distinctly remember that my colleague was standing next to me. And I said to him, hey, I think something's wrong with my kid. They are calling me. It's not even 11 o'clock. Why are they calling me? And I literally just stared at the phone. And it was just flashing, Zoe's school, Zoe's school. And I didn't pick it up. I let it lapse. And then I started calling again. And my mind went into a frenzy. I told him, they're calling her again, call twice, must be something major happened. And then he said to me in a very deadpan voice, Ishan, why don't you just pick up the phone? So I picked up the phone and the, the school said, oh, I just want to update you. And then in that moment, I felt like a fool. Why am I reacting to that? But we've all had those moments. We think, and our brain goes into overdrive when we think of the worst possible scenario. So which one was that? Was that permanence, pervasiveness, or personalization? Anyone want to guess? Personalized, right? I took it quite personally that maybe there's something wrong with her. And I went all the way to the extreme. So let's take a look at your poll results. Wow. Hey, you guys are very similar to me, huh? Wow, we have 50 over percent say that you find yourself stuck in personalization quite often, which means that maybe you tend to take things onto your shoulders when it's not really necessary. Or perhaps just like me, you think of the worst possible scenario all the time, 
right? And then we have following up close 43% think that something bad that happens in your life is permanent and not going to shift. And we have 41% following closely. So it means that now with the three Ps, number one, I hope it helps you to become more aware. Am I now stuck in this trap of personalizing? Am I stuck in pervasiveness? Am I stuck in permanence? That's my number one goal for you today, just to become aware. Okay. So 59%, um, and don't worry, I'll share with you the strategies after this. Many people, when I go to talks, they say, Shan, can you just get straight to the point? Tell me all the story. Tell me all the strategies. But I'm trying to take you on a journey, right? Where you are right now is part of the first part. Learning requires a process, right? Okay. And if I were to jump straight into the strategies, you'd be like, huh? What am I going to do with that? But first, we help your brain to become aware, to make connections between what is in the literature and what is in your lived experience. So let's go to this. So our dear Peter experienced the three Ps as you saw him just now with his cup of coffee. But he's a very good teacher and a very good student. And so his friend says, hey, Peter, you should read this book, huh? Learn Optimism. Because if you're having all these negative thoughts, maybe you need Dr. Martin Seligman's book. Incidentally, Dr. Martin Seligman was the person behind Learn Helplessness, and he's also the person behind Learn Optimism. He studied depression for 30 over years, and he came to one incredible insight. After studying depression for 30 years, he got no closer to understanding what helps people to thrive and to be happy. His conclusion, you can't study depression to understand happiness. You need to understand and study people who already display these characteristics to know exactly how they do it. And so Learn Optimism was born. And the subtext to this book is literally, how do you change your mind and your life? So Peter, He's a good student, and over the next few months, he took this book and he read it and he applied it for himself. He applied it with his students. And a few months later, there he is back in the lounge with his cup of coffee. And he's brought all his marking scripts to the, to the lounge, taking it out, and he's marking it. And as he marks, he's frowning because he's noticing that he's doing a lot of crosses, crosses, crosses. And when he's done, he realizes that, to his horror, four of his students have done really badly. Now, in that instant, Peter instantly stands up. Oh, no, what am I going to do? Four of them have not done well. It must be my teaching. You know, there was a time when I was away on MC for two weeks and there was a replacement teacher and I didn't hold my to the teacher properly. And then he sits down and he looks at the scripts again and he says, oh no, does this mean that my career as a teacher is over? But then he notices something different. He catches himself and he pauses there, takes a deep breath notices that he's actually spiraling, closes his eyes for a few minutes, and then he looks back at the scripts again. And this time, he takes a proper look at the scripts. And it is only when he glances at it in greater detail that he realizes that, yes, there are four of them who didn't do so well, but the remaining of them have shown great improvement. Peter caught himself at first. He only saw all the bad grades. But as he paused, as he calmed himself down, he allowed his brain as well to come along the journey. And he saw something that he would otherwise not have seen. Peter did the work and was able to, at least in that moment, train his brain to respond a bit differently. Now, it is, of course, a process. 
And you can't expect Peter to be able to not go into that state straight away because it is something that has been a well-trodden path of the brain. You see, if you have been thinking that way for 20, 30, for me, 40 over years, then what happens is there is a path that is very well-trodden. As I was walking here past the hive, there are parts of grass that have turned brown. Why? Because people have walked over it. We have done so many shortcuts, we've walked over it, it's familiar. I don't even need to think about it. And if we are used to thinking in the three Ps, when challenging situations come our way, it's like walking down those well-trodden paths. It becomes automatic. And therefore, what we're, Peter is actually trying to do is instead of taking that well-trodden path, we're asking Peter to, hey, try a new path. And this new path, the grass is still growing. If Peter ventures into this new path, there may be bugs and insects he has never met before. And it feels uncomfortable. It feels unfamiliar to think differently. And therefore, sometimes Peter reverts back to the well-trodden path. So his initial response is just him going down that path. And all of us will experience that at some point as you learn the process. But it's also possible that that awareness can then switch to saying, hey, I'm going down that path, but I don't have to. I can walk the new path. And literally, learn optimism is really about changing your mind so that you can change your life. So how do we support our brain? Many people think of the brain as a logical entity. It's logical. It helps us to think. It's cognition. It stores our memories. It can do so many amazing things. But the brain is very emotional as well. So how do we then support our emotional brain? First, we practice learned optimism. Number one, by what Peter was doing. First, we notice, am I personalizing? It's okay to notice that. There's no shame in recognizing that in yourself. But then, how do you move from the well-trodden path to a new path is by challenging. When Peter noticed or realized that he has four students who did really badly, he can pause and challenge. Is what I'm experiencing true? Or is it just my brain reacting to my emotions? Is it helpful for me to think this way? Or is it harmful for me to think this way? What would my colleague say to me if he or she noticed that I have four students who didn't do so well? Will the colleague come and say, hey, Peter, yala, all this well, uh, you're just such a lousy teacher. That's why your students also did so badly. Uh, you should just accept your fate. Will the teacher do that? Quite likely, no. But the truth is, we do that to ourselves. When we encounter something terrible, a thought in our head, we beat ourselves up and tell ourselves, ah, it's all because you didn't study so hard. It's all because you didn't bother. Ah, you just not cut out to do that. These are the thoughts that sometimes plague us. But in that moment, we should challenge those thoughts because those thoughts are just going down those well-trodden paths. Is it helpful to you to think that way? Is it harmful to you to think that way? And then once you've challenged it, maybe you'll come to a more balanced perspective and end up being able to reframe it Instead of Peter thinking, I'm such a bad teacher, maybe he would think, hey, there are 40 students that I've helped improve and there are four who still is a work in progress. That is far more helpful than thinking, I'm a bad teacher. Similarly for all of you, if you encounter some challenge in an assignment you're doing, it is far more helpful to tell yourself, I'm facing a roadblock in this assignment as opposed to saying, I can't do this and I'm lousy at this. The first keeps you stuck. The second allows you to move on with some optimism. So notice, challenge, reframe. Now the second strategy is more about the heart. I was talking about the brain and how did I segue to the heart? You see, emotions may be controlled in the brain, but we feel it here. And sometimes we feel it in our whole body. So we're going to do a little practice just for you to experience it. Otherwise, 
just talking alone, you may not be able to connect physically with it. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to adjust the way you're seating slightly for this activity. Would that be okay, everybody? Yes, okay, so if you just look at me in front over here, I'm going to pull my chair out and sit right here in the middle. And for those of you who are online, you can also do the same. Now, you can't move your chair and you're happily seated there. That's great. But what I would love for you to do is to sit a little bit forward in your chair. Okay, that means not like this, like that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to sit a little bit forward if possible. Both legs on the ground. And if your hands, you can just have them placed here. As long as you're comfortable, right? And for this exercise, all you need to do is just listen to my voice. I will invite you to minimize distraction around you by looking downwards at your toes or at the ground. Now, along the process, if you find yourself getting distracted, meaning that some random thoughts come in or your stomach starts to growl, what you can do is just notice that you've been distracted and then come back to my voice. Okay, and if you feel that you're going to doze off, you can have your eyes open and looking straight. That's totally fine. Okay, everybody, in this short moment, I'm going to invite you to walk through a little exercise together with me that's known as the RAIN method. Now, in order for the RAIN method to work well, I'll first need you to think or bring to your mind a thought that you had recently that was not so positive. It could be a permanent thought, a pervasive thought, or a personalized thought, or it could just be something like, is there something wrong with me? You don't have to share it with anyone, but just keep it in your mind as we go through this process. All right, everyone. Now that you have the thought in your mind, the first thing we're going to do is to recognize the thought. You know, sometimes when difficult thoughts come our ways, we, we try to push it away. We try to distract ourselves and we don't actually acknowledge its presence. So in this moment, we just say, hey, I recognize that it's there, whatever that thought is. You don't need to do anything about it, and you don't need to respond in any way except to notice it as if this is just like a bird that's perching on your windowsill, and you notice, oh, there's a bird. Now that you have recognized it, we're going to move on to A. A simply is accepting that it's there. You know, sometimes when you see that thought, you want to throw it away. You want to shoo the bird away. But in this moment, we just accept and allow that the thought is present. And again, we don't need to run away from it. And if you feel that, oh, I don't like to face this, just allow yourself to be present to as much as what you can take. And just allow it to be there without having to do anything about it. Now, the third part of the process is I. I means gentle investigation with curiosity and with kindness. Where did that thought come from? What is that thought telling me about the situation, how do I feel in this moment? And what am I learning from having this thought? Again, we investigate with kindness towards ourselves. We investigate with curiosity about what it could be. But we're not judging it, asking it to go away, making ourselves feel worse. And if you notice yourself going down the rabbit hole, Pull yourself back and just notice that it's there. And last of all, we end off with non-identifying. 
You know, it's so easy when something, a negative thought comes to us that we take it and put it into our handbag and we keep it there and we take it all to ourselves. But in this moment, you're not going to do that. It's almost as if it is just something on the TV screen. And at first, when you're close up to the TV screen, it all looks very big and very daunting. But what you're going to do in your mind is to pull back from the TV screen, stand further and further and further and further away until the TV screen is almost like just a dot in the sky. And now as you look around, you realize that that TV screen from a different perspective in the grand scheme of things is not that big after all. It's just that in the moment, it feels huge. In the moment, it occupies so much of your mind space. So as you observe that TV screen, I want you to come back to that thought that you had right at the beginning, whether it is I'm not good enough, whether it is I can't get anything right, whether it is this is going to last or my life is over. What are your thoughts as you notice pulling back from the TV screen what do you notice about how you're feeling in your body? What do you notice about the thoughts in your mind? How are you experiencing looking at it from a further vantage point? Now, in a short moment, I'm going to ring a bell. And all I'm going to ask you to do is just focus your attention on the sound of the bell and nothing else. And when you no longer hear the resonance of the bell, you may open your eyes. All right, everyone. You may open your eyes gently. Welcome back. <laughs> All right, so this little process that I just brought you through is just a process to go within. You know, we live in a world where there is so much stimulation from the outside. People telling us what to do, social media looking at what everyone's posting online, comparing whether our outfit today is nice or not. Maybe for some of you, it's not whether they bought the latest game or not. There's so much stimulation coming from outside that we rarely make time for what's happening in our inner world. But if we are to nurture our brain, if we are to shift the way that we feel and think, we can't be attending only to what's outside of us. We need to attend to what's inside of us. And so the process that I just brought you through is actually called the RAIN method. As you can see the quote there, when emotions overwhelm, just let it rain. Sometimes we shove it under the carpet. Sometimes we project it onto other people. Sometimes we go into overdrive and channel all that emotion just into studying and studying and studying. All of that is external. But with rain, we go inside first to recognize that something happened, recognize the thought that we had. And then... We accept the experience as it is. We don't judge. Nobody's looking at us when we're doing that. And we just recognize that that moment that we have with ourselves is so hard to come by. And then the third step is gentle investigation. Our inner critic investigates with a vengeance. But in this moment, it's gentle. It's just saying, where did that come from? How do I understand myself in this moment? What is my response all about? Nobody has to know the answer except you. And then finally, non-identify. Put it on the TV screen external to yourself and move back and move back and realize, hey, it is just one part of my life. It is just one part of my day. And in that moment, our dear Peter may not need to feel like the world's going to end or that he can never be a teacher anymore. So I'm just going to pause here and I'll just give you two minutes to talk to your neighbor. What was that experience like? How did it feel? 
And if you don't want to talk about how it feels, you can share which part of it did you find useful or helpful. Okay, I'm going to take a walk. Huh? Let's see where I end up. Huh? I'm going to ask some people, okay, which part of the process was helpful? Which part? What did you feel? I'm going to come all the way here to these two ladies. Hi, ladies. Do you want to share with me what was that experience like? Yep, thank you. Let's hear from them, yeah? Yes, go ahead. Uh, first, I saw, uh, I'm really relaxed. Feel more relaxed? Yeah. Yeah. I just, um, uh, I just uh, cannot, I just can put off all my stress. Like, um, uh, I don't, I can forget my uh, stress about work, stress about uh, studies. And mm -hmm. like I said, I just enjoy the moment. Yeah. Enjoy the moment. You can put it aside. And enjoy the moment. Okay, let's pass the mic around. Uh, and come in behind here. What was it like for you? <laughs> yeah, anything. Or oh, which part of the process did you find helpful? Oh, I feel less stressful. Less stressful. How do you know that you are you feel less stressful? Uh like I separate myself from like the thought of like studying or uh, yeah. exams. Yeah, you separate yourself from the thought and what you're experiencing. Okay, let's come over here. Hello. How about yourself? Uh, let's I, hear from more people, yes. I think the third steps are something new to me that I did not really explore how... The to... third step, the investigate? Yes, yes, because I never really go through that. In... Yeah. I think so much of what we learned. Thank you. Can we give them all a round of applause? Thank you. Uh, I just picked on them. Thank you so much. But, you know, we never really stopped to do step number three. Many of us notice it. Just now I asked you to challenge it. And now I'm actually asking, if you don't mind, I'm now actually asking you to investigate. But investigate doesn't mean that you have to go and dig and dig. But really is trying to understand ourselves a little better. And when we understand ourselves a little better, we then know how to redirect how we are thinking and redirect our attention onto the parts that really can help us to feel better. Okay, so that's the RAIN method. So the next time you're feeling stressed and two of the responses, one was about, I can distance myself from that. And the other response was, I can be in the moment. I can be present in the moment. So third one is express. So we notice, we challenge, we reframe, we go inward, we get to know ourselves a little better. But then what happens to all that emotion? Sometimes it gets pent up. And I like to use the analogy of a volcano, right? You have a lot of emotion and it gets stored and it gets stored. And if we never express it, at some point, what will happen? And so we need to express, to help our brain, we actually need to express our emotions. Now, is it about going on social media to vent? Rawr! Okay, I express, Sean. Oh, that one is major one. Huh? Or is it about being able to be aware that once you express it, you can identify it? So for example, if we want to express it, we can choose to speak it, tell someone about it. Some of you may do journaling, we can write it, or we can show it. Sometimes we don't even show that we're angry. If we are, we don't even want to show people that we need help. We just keep the same facial expression. But what that does is that we end up storing everything inside. And it just needs one thing to poof, and the explosion comes. So Susan David, who is the author of the book Emotional Agility, talks about how important it is for us to label our emotion. We acknowledged it, but do we actually know what we are feeling? And do you know what is the emotion that most people will say, which actually is not accurate? People often say, I feel so blank. Anybody want to guess what that emotion is? It's a, again? Again, mad. Yeah, mad, right? Yeah. Most people will say they're angry, but actually they're sad. 
Some people say they are angry, but actually they feel guilty. Some people say they are angry, but actually they feel lonely. It's because we're so used to just using one word to encapsulate everything that we feel. But in her work and in many of the other psychologists' work, the finer and more specific we can get with our emotions, the better it is for our brain to acknowledge what we are experiencing in our mind and our body with that specific word. So for example, someone took your wallet and never returned it. You can say, I'm so angry. Or you could also say, oh, I went to the food court, I put my tissue paper there to choke. Someone took my tissue paper. I'm so angry. But notice there's no difference in the intensity of the angry. It's just that same word. Maybe the first one is you're mad. Maybe the second one is you're irritated. But if we are not specific, our brain lumps everything all together. And it's really hard to distinguish. The more that we can be specific, the more that we can label it allows us, our brain now to have this thing called readiness potential. Readiness to take action. Otherwise, we're so sucked into the emotion that we can't act at all. Okay, so there are some examples over there. I won't go too much into it. But I do want to also end off with the last strategy. So far, you have heard notice. You have heard challenge. You have heard reframe. We have gone inward. We have learned about expression. And finally, how do we get to positivity? We have to be intentional about positivity. People think, but hey, if your life is going well, you should naturally be positive. Not true. It depends on where your attention is placed. If your life is going well, but you pay attention to the fact that today was raining the whole day, maybe you'll think, oh, today was not a good day. So we want to tune into gratitude. Okay, things that are going well in our life, sometimes we don't see it. And Dr. Robert Emmons describes gratitude as an appreciation of awe and wonder of the things around us that we sometimes may not notice. Right? And as we do that, we're actually priming the brain that, hey, you can feel this way. You can redirect your attention this way because when you feel more positive, you actually can think better. You can learn better. Have you ever tried studying and studying and studying, cram an exam, three, four hours, and the next day you sat there and nothing came in? For those of us working in adults, maybe you have to do a presentation in front of your boss and you looked at the PowerPoint slide and you read and you read and you read, but when you stood up there, gibberish came out. What's actually happening there? It happens to all of us, and the reason for that is that when we are stressed, our brain can't function. It's seized. So in order for it to be relaxed, we now have to tune in to what's going well. And that allows us to be better at problem solving, allows us to bounce back, to think of new ideas. It allows us to learn better. Okay, so one last thing, and I'll do a little example. What is one thing that has gone well for you today? Or what is one thing that you might be grateful for and it's not a listing exercise, by the way. It's not like, oh, I'm grateful for my hair. I'm grateful my clothes fit so well. And that's it, you know. We're not going to stop there, right? We actually want to go into why are you grateful for it? So just one thing. So for me, one thing I'm grateful for is that today, my GPS worked. And I found Lee Kong Tian Lecture Theatre. And why am I grateful? Because if the speaker doesn't arrive, then everybody else is very kanjiong. <laughs> and I will also be in a panic state. We go into the why because that's where the brain connects with the heart. We actually feel the gratitude. Otherwise, it's just a listening exercise. Okay, so one last one. Huh? If you have shared with the person to your left and you shared to the right, now you can go behind or in front. Okay, one last pair share. And those of you who are online, we'll put up a slido so that you can also scan in and share with us what are you grateful for and why. Okay, let's do that. It's one last minute. What are you grateful for and why? Okay, someone says here, grateful for every day. 
So um, let's go back to let's go back to to the slide. Just one last part. You know, just looking at all your responses, I'm grateful for everybody's participation, sense of humor. And of course, I did put you on the spot a number of times, especially those of you that I went up. I'm grateful that you didn't run away from my mic. And also grateful that you did the process together with me. I know it's late in the day and you could have other things to be doing, but you chose to be here. And for that, I'm very grateful. So as we think about nurturing the brain with positivity, you'll notice that as I went through the slides, I brought you through a process. Now, if I were to just appear on stage and say, come on, be positive, maybe you'd be like, eh, why should I? But the brain is something that we can nurture. First, by acknowledging where we are. You first learned that perhaps there were three Ps that you didn't realize you had. And then after that, we got the brain ready because with that acknowledgement, we were now able to challenge some of those thoughts that may not have been helpful for us. And then we went into going inward because when we are inward, we have greater clarity over what that thought actually means to us and what it tells us about ourselves. And then we learned that we need to express it, don't just keep it inside. And finally, we end off with positivity. Now it's so hard. I don't know if you have ever experienced when people come to you, you're having a bad day and they tell you, it's okay, Rana, tomorrow will be a better day. Cheer up. I don't know why you're laughing. Why? Because that sometimes feels fake. True? That sometimes feels like toxic positivity. Now, the positivity I want to share with you is not toxic. We are preparing your brain in the whole process that you have been through tonight to finally be able to end on that positive note with genuine laughter and all of that that happened on the gratitude board. It was by design. Okay, so cultivate, learn optimism, practice the RAIN method, express your emotions, tune into gratitude. And that's how you can train your brain.